A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences, including writers, filmmakers, composers and musicians, and of course other artists, and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. In this episode, it's A Brush With Emma Talbot, who brings together drawing, painting, text and sculpture in installations that fuse a personal response to her internal emotional world with societal and geopolitical issues from feminism to capitalism and climate change. Emma was born in Stourbridge in the Midlands of the UK, but grew up in Kent in southern England. She studied art there and later in Birmingham in the late 1980s, before completing an MA at the Royal College of Art in London in 1995. Emma's art has always been about storytelling through imagery and text. Her earlier works were more episodic, reflecting some autobiographical elements, including her upbringing, her experiences of single motherhood and grief following the death of her husband, alongside responses to literature, film and television, often in multiple bordered sections, almost like a graphic novel. In this period, up to around the early 2010s, she defined a distinctive artistic language, with drawing at its core, featuring faceless figures with outsized heads set in interior cityscapes or landscapes, with particular attention given to pattern and texture. Increasingly, those patterns have become more dominant and freer, and Emma's imagery has been unleashed into enthralling compositions that teem with figuration, abstraction and decorative shape, realised on a vast scale. A major factor in this development has been Emma's progression from canvas to silk as the surface of her paintings. Increasingly, her work appears in the form of environments where huge silk paintings hang within the exhibition space so that they overwhelm the viewer and submerge us in her world. The silk paintings are often accompanied by her fabric and papier-mâché sculptures in which figures appear to burst from the hangings into our three-dimensional world. Both the sculptures and the paintings are punctuated by text which both explains and complicates the imagery around it. Emma's at the height of her powers today and many of her most impressive works have been created in the past five years, all of them rich in illusion and visionary narrative. For Ghost Calls, an exhibition at DCA in Dundee in Scotland in 2021, she researched female keeners, professional mourners from Celtic history, and used them as the foundation stone for explorations of ancient landscapes, the ghosts of the past and the wildness of nature. In her presentation for the 59th Venice Biennale as part of Cecilia Alemani's international national exhibition, The Milk of Dreams, she used Paul Gauguin's celebrated painting, Where Do We Come From, What Are We, Where Are We Going, and the French artist's journey to Tahiti as the springboard to explore the destructive impulses of humans amid climate catastrophe. And in the work she made during an Italian residency after winning the 2020 Max Mara Art Prize for Women, Emma's responded to Gustav Klimt's painting, The Three Ages of Women, to reimagine the 12 labours of Hercules through the 12 principles of permaculture, picturing a post extractive and post-anthropocentric future. Characteristically, the imagery for this latest work derives from deep research into ancient Italian and Etruscan art, pottery and textiles. Among the works made on her Italian residency is an animation, a new medium she taught herself during the COVID-19 lockdown, and a natural extension for her work given the abundant sense of movement in her paintings and drawings. These complex networks of references are allied to a profound emotional power. In front of her work, it's as if we observe her thinking through her subject matter and feelings, witness a discussion in her subconscious and it's this with which I began our conversation. I was intrigued to read that she sees her work as an equivalent to literature written in the first person and I wondered if she might explain this a little further. Well I I wanted to make work which was able to describe the experience of that type of thinking where thinking is so layered that you're incorporating what you see, what you experience with always a a kind of ongoing narrative, which is really interesting, I thought, because it's reflective, it's fragmentary and it happens seamlessly. But sometimes we notice ourselves thinking in particular ways and I really wanted to be able to demonstrate that somehow. And the the closest comparison I could make 
was for a viewer, what I wanted the viewer experience to be was to be able to listen to my thinking or be party to my thinking in all its layers, in all its kinds of uh, different shapes. And I thought the closest thing to that is when you have a, a novel in the first person, you're able to inhabit the I of the first person. And you're able to inhabit the thinking of characters who are really distinct from you. And at the same time, it's convincing. You know, when it works, it doesn't feel as if it's very clunky that you're inside someone's mind. In fact, it's really fascinating. But that character is quite often meeting the world. And that was really important to me, that the interior of thinking wasn't something very separate from the rest of the things that happen in the world and that we're people who operate in the world. But it was more about this sort of taking in, reflecting and being able to demonstrate that. And does that require a certain level of vulnerability in your case, in that sense of, you know, I'm really conscious of that voice that you talk about and how it speaks to me Mm. as a viewer and sometimes it's quite plaintive at other times more reflective but it seems to me that it requires that to a certain extent you make yourself vulnerable it doesn't feel very vulnerable because I think it it's honest I mean I'm I'm trying to be as honest as I can be and when I think it's honest when I'm convinced by what I'm doing then I don't feel any sense of kind of doubt about it like oh I shouldn't say this or I mean, the the text that I use is quite well chosen. It's not very stream of consciousness in that it isn't controlled. It has some level of control. I really think about what the wording will be. But I don't feel very vulnerable about it. I think I'm trying to transmit that kind of interplay between, you know, anxiety, uh, thoughts, wandering, and the kinds of things that you bring you know, in conversation, maybe, outside, you know. And looking at your work, I'm really conscious of that thing that Jean Cocteau said about how drawing was an extension of his handwriting. Mm. And it seems to me that that meeting of image and text, it feels like the two flow together, even though Mm. sometimes the text can be very discreet and, you know, boxed or enclosed in shape. Somehow there's a continuity between the writing and the drawing. Yeah, and the writing is always done with a brush. So... It has a kind of speed which is really, it's the same as a drawing speed. The drawings are always with a brush. So there's a speed that's really distinct from handwriting with a pen. And also, yeah, I I think I've always wanted to write, but then at a certain point it's as if I can only write so much and then it has to become an image. You know, I've never been able to sustain writing for a really long period. It's always as if the the two things are together. And then drawing, it seems to me, it feels almost like an instinct for you. It's such a fundamental element of the practice. Even the sculptures look like drawing to a certain degree. I'm really happy to hear you say that because I think of the, the 3D work. I don't call them sculptures because that sounds too formal, I think. But the 3D work, I think of them as drawings in three dimensions and I think drawing for me is really fundamental because it's how I can see how I'm thinking what I'm thinking and it's very open it's a very open space and it's sort of to say it doesn't matter means it it really does matter but at the same time it isn't under pressure and uh, that's really useful for me and is there an element of automatism about the drawing obviously you were talking earlier on about how it's about thought and about conveying thought, but at the same time, is there are there moments of not thinking, if you like, an instinct in applying the, the marks? Yeah, definitely. And when I'm drawing, I draw to see what I'm thinking. So I don't know what I'm going to draw, and I don't want to know what I'm going to draw, just draw what, whatever comes to mind. And I don't want to make a plan, I'm going to draw this, because I won't believe in it. So it has to be something that just comes to mind and then I can surprise myself that, oh, I'm interested in this or I'm thinking about that or this seems kind of curious and I'm just following whatever comes out and then literally putting the drawings to one side and not really analysing them very much at all. And then maybe when there's a group of them 
looking through them to see is there something in common? Is there something that's really a driving force in these drawings that has to be expanded in other works? You know, that sort of, that happens. And then in terms of the work, for instance, when you paint on silk, I'm wondering about how that is different in terms of a material to painting on paper or, or another surface, how the sort of relative lack of resistance of silk compared to, say, even canvas mm-hmm. or certainly board or something mm-hmm. like that. How does that influence the way that you actually make the marks? I chose the silk as a way to find an equivalent for the drawing. The drawings were made over time. They started to be made on handmade paper cardi paper which can be very thin which can be very light and I wanted to find an equivalent and I didn't like the hardness of say board or I didn't like the rigidity of a canvas I didn't like the given of it being a rectangle I really wanted it to be something that was almost like shapeless like I could shape it and for some reason silk seemed to me a really good equivalent for the paper that I was using to draw and also I bought it dyed so it's dyed pale pink or it's dyed a kind of sable colour sandy kind of colour as a starting point it felt like something that had of its own quality a lightness a very sort of lovely quality that for me was an equivalent to the paper that I could take a piece of paper and just look at it and then think about drawing onto it. I felt the same about the silk, but the silk is pinned really tight to be able to paint on it because you're right, if you try to paint on silk without doing that, it's just, it would be impossible. And it's a quite a difficult material to manage the paint on. It must require a certain lightness because I can imagine with too much paint, with too much material, it just could sag or or somehow lose that sort of wonderful lightness it does have. Yeah, you're right. Too much fluidity of paint means that you can't control it and it just makes a stain. Too solid paint means you can't move the paint around. You know, there, there are conditions that over time I've really got to know. You know, I understand it's quite haptic in the sense that I can feel this will work that won't and it can't be overloaded because it becomes crunchy like a sort of really strange solid surface and it's something that it's almost like in dialogue with this material then things happen things can happen and sometimes it pushes me to do things that you know in a way meeting the requirements of the material that's quite a nice relationship But the only thing about it is that every single mark I make has to be, you know, the first time mark is the mark it's going to be. You can't take it off. You can't change it. You can't correct it. And that's really similar to paper, drawing on paper. And that for me felt like a relief because it eliminates uh, a kind of doubt. I had a problem with oil paint, for example, because I could change it. I would think, oh, it could be this, or it could be that, or it could be, or I could do this, and I, it could be forever. I would be changing the same thing. So I like the directness. I wanted to talk about your subject matter and, and the mood in the work, because mm. I was really conscious looking at your piece in the Venice Biennale this year, that on the one hand, it's catastrophic. It's mm. about the apocalypse to a certain degree. It's, yeah. it's about the extractive yeah. life of humans. But also there is an element of reverie and, a, and also an element of hope. And it seems to me that the sort of tension between those two different impulses seem to drive the work to a certain degree. Yeah, that's true. There, there has to be in the work for me a, a reality, which is a response to things that are happening today, to the contemporary, to say that I am a being in the world today. It's not like I go off into some kind of dream space to make art it has to meet the things that are happening that really concern me the work's only ever about what really really concerns me at the point of making and so there are layers of thinking that are very clearly a sense of the disastrous the catastrophic the the reality of the situations that we're in that are terrifying they are terrifying and at the same time we still have a capacity to be thinking on all kinds of levels about, 
you know, we still have a kind of wishfulness about our continuance that, you know, it's still there. We still get up every day and do similar things that we do each day in a not kind of over-anxious, disastrous kind of mode of being and thinking. But also there is a, a sort of movement between the everydayness of a human and this incredible space of the universe, for example. So that temporality is quite elastic in the work and relationships are quite elastic, like a something can be very everyday and at the same time it could be about the enormous qualities of nature and the universe and energies and, you know, things that are gigantic, you know. Absolutely. And and then also, of course, that you I mean you talk about that temporal elasticity. Mm-hmm. One's very conscious that signs or or in fact individual moments of iconography appear to be absolutely from our present they might be a smartphone or something like that but then at the same time one is also conscious of a a kind of ancient language of form that appears to sort of ripple through all the way through the work yeah and we are that I mean I think we are that when we we make these connections you know temporality is very elastic we still have in our DNA we have traces of really ancient previous beings if you like and at the same time we're we're dealing with a an everyday which will become history then the way that our minds i think our minds work is that our minds are offering us relative things so you meet something new you see something new and your mind is really actively trying to offer you all the things that you've experienced before to try to accommodate this new thing so that that kind of shift and movement is something I'm very conscious of that I want to be there in the work. You know, we're part of an enormous ancient scheme and and the very small schemes of the everyday. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? This is really difficult for me to condense down. And actually what I realised is it's an anecdote, but I grew up in a very suburban, on a housing estate, very suburban place where there wasn't anything about art where I grew up. It was very... Is this Strood in Kent? In, it's Strood in Kent, yeah. We moved, I think, when I was about seven we moved from London to Strood (laughs) and so where we lived was a very I sort of almost said a void and I don't want to be sort of uh, mean about that environment we didn't go to museums we didn't see artworks we didn't I didn't see anything like that but by contrast my mum's parents were German Jewish refugees from Berlin and my grandfather was a research scientist at Oxford and they travelled a lot. They were really interested in artefacts. So they had in their house a really big collection of things that they'd gathered, which were, for example, Japanese lacquer medicine cases, or netsuke, or painted scrolls, or Thai masks, or African figurines, all kinds of Indian carvings, all kinds of things in their house, which they had on display. Some of them were in cabinets with lights, you know, like a sort of a museum almost. And so for me, there was this big contrast where everyday life was devoid of thinking about art. But the only thing was that I spent a lot of time drawing. I was drawing by myself and drawing was a space to uh, create or imagine another place. But the first things that I loved were these objects in my grandparents' house that for me felt like more than just the object. It felt like this space where all of these amazing objects and materials exist. And I think I still try and go there. It's a funny thing. I I was really trying to think about this. That's for me the most impressive memory I have. And did you have any explanation from your grandparents as to what they were or did Mm. they live in the space of your imagination to a certain extent? Uh, Kind of half and half. But I remember with the Japanese medicine cases, taking them apart and seeing inside them and, you know, 
interacting with these things because they were in the house. And just spending time looking at things was part of being there, you know, just noticing and looking at things. And, you know, my grandparents had very, very strong German accents and they, the way they described or the way they spoke about things, for me, it just felt like this is entirely pleasurable. You know, I could just stay here, just in this feeling. I don't know. It's very attractive for me, very satisfying environment, that's, I felt like. That's absolutely lovely. And because it was distinct, I think that's why I was sort of in love with it, I think. I also wanted to ask about, was there any comic uh, book life in your early years? Because particularly with your earlier work, I see a sort of element of comics. Yeah. Was that there in your childhood? Sort of. But when people ask me about comics, I always say, well, I'm, I'm not that interested in them, you know, to be honest. But that's not to say I did read Tintin. I read Tintin books. I wanted to be able to draw like Hergé. <laughs> um, but I was really, I was always really looking at how things were drawn, I think, and deciding whether I liked how they were drawn or not. But I wasn't a massive fan of comics, but it is not to say that I didn't read comics. We did read comics, but it didn't feel like a hugely important thing. And in fact, for me, putting text and image together felt like a very different place than a, a type of description that would be in a graphic novel or in a comic because the text serves the image in a comic in a very particular way. It tells you what it is you're looking at. Whereas for me, the text and the image sit equivalently, but they don't support one another in that very direct way I think no I think that's a very apt description yeah absolutely which historical artist do you turn to the most today it's again really hard to reduce down but I think Sassetta the sort of just pre-renaissance Italian painter Sassetta mm. is for me an incredible incredible painter and I think it's a number of things I think it's because the description of scenes is really imaginary. So the painting comes from a world where people haven't travelled extensively, they can't see everything, so they have to imagine and invent what that looked like, what things looked like. And so, for example, when Sassetta paints Ranieri helping prisoners escape from a prison, the figures come through the wall, and Ranieri is this monk who's floating in the sky... You know, it's improbable, but it's a really wonderful description when he paints St. Anthony being beaten by the devils. The way he describes devils is that they're these bird-footed, hairy animals with snake arms. And, you know, how would you imagine a death? There's something about the imagination that carries information and the formal quality of the way colour is distributed and the way that the figures stand uh, or that the imagery is organised is very, for me, it's really, really satisfying that they're very simple and complicated. They're very quiet and formal, but they're strangely inventive. You know, they have so many qualities that I really do love. I think I could look at them forever. I really could. <laughs> no, they are extremely beautiful and, a, and that sort of incredible placidity, that incredible yeah. calm yeah. that transmits from the from the works. Yeah. But would it be as literal as you looking at, at Sassetta and and seeing that sort of there is a lovely fluid and quite elongated occasionally mm. representation of figures in mm. Sassetta's work. And I wonder if, you know, to what extent do you find there's a literal translation into your work ever? Not directly, but there is something, you know, when you talked about the calmness of the Sassetta painting, there are other things that I, you know, that are historical that I really return to, which are, for example, Japanese prints and Etruscan pottery or Greek pottery, the depictions on those, because I think they're really well drawn. And because all of them, and Sassetta has this as well, the figuration, the characterization is neutral enough that they're always recognisably similar. They have a kind of stylized quality which is always maintained the same kind of level of stylization, And they're neutral and quiet, but they tell really incredible, there's incredible storytelling, which can be very exaggerated as a story, but it's very 
sort of placid. That quality is in all of those three. And there's something about it that's like, it's always the same, but it's fascinatingly different in the storytelling. I like that, and I, I think about that in my work. I was going to ask you about Klimt when we were talking about historical artists, because mm. this Klimt painting, Three Ages of Woman, informs your work that you've just made, which will go and show at the White Chapel and, and Collezioni Marimotti yeah. uh, later in the year. But it's not a total admiration of that painting, no. is it, behind that? There's, it's a complex relationship you have with that work. Yeah, and I think I have a complex relationship with Klimt's paintings in general because I really do like his paintings. And at the same time, I find them really problematic. I mean, I really do love the Beethoven frieze, but it's terribly problematic. It's really problematic what it's telling. The undercurrent of what it's saying is, I I find it troubling, enormously troubling. The Three Ages of Woman is a painting. It's quite a good example of what's problematic in Klimt because... The observational description of the figure, which is then quite often he uses this observation that's surrounded by um, pattern and design, so that the two things kind of operate together. The really detailed observation of the elderly woman is quite grotesque. So although he's telling every detail of the veins and the skin of the woman, he because the woman has her head in her hands and she's standing as if she's in shame, It's as if he's telling us to look at this, but be repulsed. Look at this, it's really repulsive, it's really horrific. And then, in contrast, the younger figure with the baby is this very sort of beautiful, stylized figure that isn't quite so analytically drawn. And I was horrified, (laughs) you know, fascinated and horrified, because, you know, it's true that I do, I do really like Klimt's paintings, but... I found my, well, also the elderly woman has the same hair as me, so she has long (laughs) grey hair. And I found myself thinking, oh my God, that's like a horrible image of that's what the future looks like, being old looks like that. And and then I found myself feeling quite angry about this idea that this woman is fascinatingly horrific. And the other figure is, you know, something to be celebrated. And that is the three, there's a younger woman holding a baby. And those are the three ages of woman, like one woman, all have this experience of life. It made me feel, I know Klimt's paintings come from a a particular era, but even so, the message, I found it troubling. (laughs) And then there's this additional sort of weirdly troubling element which is its role in the national story of Italy right. and why it is in Rome where, and of course you're talking to us from Italy now so yeah. you spent time with this painting there yeah. Right? yeah which is fascinating which is for me the part that makes it more interesting so the subjective this is probably a very really good description of what happens in my work this is subjective reaction and then that gets put in a context because I start to research and I start to want to know and I found out that the painting was acquired as a celebration of 50 years of the unification of Italy, which is a a way of making a modern country. And then I was thinking, well, that's a really strange painting to choose. What does that mean? And I started to think then the young woman and the baby are this sort of promising future of this sort of very modernist idea of the safety of a type of understanding, which is modern science, a type of pure idea of a a Catholic religion. And then the elderly figure could be, I thought, representative of superstition, older belief systems, ancient belief systems, which have kind of relationships to the earth or beliefs which are outside of this cleanliness of modernism, if you like. And I, I thought it's interesting because we contemporaneously are turning to ancient practices and trying to learn from them in order to construct a kind of sustainable future. And I thought, isn't it interesting that at this period of time we're actually looking towards this elderly figure and what she represents or might represent and trying to learn. And also it struck me the idea of the future being this younger thing is actually a strange idea because the future is always older. You know, I found that curious and interesting. That is indeed. And and to what extent are you sort of reclaiming that figure for your work? Is she recognisably part of the work to a degree? Yeah, I spent a long time trying to work out how to draw her because they're also animations. 
Um, so she's animated, doing things. I spent a long time trying to find an equivalent that she's enough like the Klimt painting. And she's enough like, I wanted her to be a bit like Etruscan images of Hercules because one of the things she does is re-performing the trials of Hercules. So I wanted her to be a figure that could be exactly how I described before, a very standard figure you always recognise, quite stylized. But I wanted to say that this elderly figure is not a kind of weak, redundant, obsolete figure. She's a figure who is really active, is really wise, can apply her thinking really cleverly to situations and in a way guide us towards a future that might be uh, viable. And tell me about how you've done that in terms of the, the Hercules story. Yeah. Obviously, you could argue that the story of the 12 trials of Hercules are a kind of extractive, you know, uh, symbolic of man's triumph over everything. And therefore, yeah. to what extent is your story a kind of reversal of that and a kind of story for a post-extractive age, a, yeah. a more than human world, as it were? Yeah, so to make it make sense, I wanted the figure to go into the future and, you know, make a sustainable future. But I thought really if she wanted to do that, she'd have to dismantle systems that are in place in order to be free to be able to do that. Because at the moment we're blocked by these kinds of seem like intransigent systems. And so I I thought at the time... There was a lot of reference made to the classics in our, in the UK government. We would hear, you know, Brexit was a Herculanean task. And the reference to the classics, I, it aggravated me a bit because I kept thinking, mentioning the classics is a shorthand way of saying there's a certain type of profile of person who holds power and it always was like this and it always will be like this. And that in itself is a fiction. The classics are a, a type of fiction. The idea of the white male sculpture hero, you know, the classical figure, is a fiction. So I started to think if she was going to reorder systems, historical systems, the Trials of Hercules are great because there are 12 examples of hero story and how he develops over time. But when you look at how he resolved the trials he did them really without thinking about what is the problem and how could it be resolved for the long term. He did it by aggression, by killing, capturing, stealing, types of colonisation and these ways of resolving are, are sort of immediate. And for me, it was really like, get it done. You know this phrase, get this done, get Brexit done, get it done. It just, it felt like that there was an equivalent for me in a type of authority that says... I decided to do this, there, it's done. I thought the elderly woman would be wiser and she would look really carefully at what the problem really was. And then she would try and find a way of resolving things that meant that there was more balance, there was more of a kind of understanding of the other, that, you know, she would bring some kind of real sense of how to resolve something problematic. And that could be, for me, really interesting in terms of thought experiments for each of the trials, you know, to apply each trial to a contemporary problem, if you like, and think about how to think around them. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The free app offers access to more than 75 cultural organisations through a single download, ranging from the Morgan Library and Museum in New York, the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh and the Venice Biennale. As you've already heard, Emma's work features in The Milk of Dreams, the international exhibition at the heart of the 59th Biennale, and she's also shown at other institutions with interactive guides on Bloomberg Connects, including Turner Contemporary in Margate on England's southeast coast. Download the app and you can find out about the gallery's current and past exhibitions, as well as ongoing commissions, including Anthony Gormley's Another Time. Discover Gormley's sculpture, one of his trademark cast iron figures standing on the seafront beneath Turner Contemporary, through an audio description or a beautiful video showing the work emerging from the sea as low tide nears. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store or Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.
Which contemporary artists do you most admire? The contemporary artists that I admire are, are quite, is changing all the time because it's based on, you know, what shows I've seen, what's mm. really struck me, obviously. So Erica Vazuti, I absolutely love her work. I saw her show at the Pompidou. I went twice to Paris to see it because I really, I thought it was amazing. Mika Rottenberg, um, mm. Spaghetti Blockchain. I really do love her work. Huma Baba. It's not to say that I, I like all of the work by one artist. You know, For example, Agnieszka Polska mm. uh, made a video called Future Days, which I, I think is a wonderful piece of work. Michael Bootler. I uh, saw an amazing show in Hamburger Bahnhof, and that for me has to do with materiality. And someone like Thomas Halsego, it would be the same. Mm. Monster Chetwind, Shabalala Self. When things are composite, I quite like the way things are made from composite materialities. Julian Cruze, I saw an amazing show in Palais de Tokyo, which made me really excited, in fact, and that's to do with how different media are, are combined. How something is articulated that is quite layered and how to go about articulating in ways that are really surprising. Otbong in Kanga, is the same, the way the performance and elements and making intertwine to sort of articulate something that's otherwise very difficult to pin down. Uh, sorry, this list is exhaustive. It's really fun. <laughs> um, Jordan Wolfson's female figure, mm. which I think is brilliant. And partly it's brilliant because of the way it, it speaks. You know, it has this very male voice and it says things like, it gives instructions like, say, feeling love. But it's really <laughs> creepy. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Hey Gu Yang, the mobile works. Mm. Wong Ping's animations, Ian Cheng. Mm. Uh, and those are interesting for me, his animated works, because they're, they're sort of based on algorithms and and kind of gaming techniques i think that i find that fascinating and caroline ashant the tufted work i really love it i always find it like really thrilling when i come across a contemporary artist who like for example i have to say this i've only seen images of emmy al rai's show at eastside projects because mm. i've been in italy but that is a show that i would have loved to have seen mm. you know I find it really exciting when I see something that then I have this like real desire to go and experience. You're in the Venice Biennale as we speak. Mm. How does it feel to be among a range of other artists, lots of whose themes and ideas interrelate with yours? And, it, you know, clearly that's a very well curated show by Cecilia mm. Armani. There's lots mm. of correspondence between the works. What's it like as an artist to be part of that kind of very dialogue-y show, you know? It's really wonderful for me to see my work in that context. It's definitely a high point, a moment where, you know, seeing my work in relation to other artworks that I find really, really exciting. That is, that's, it sounds so corny, but it really is an honour to see my work there like that. Curatorially, I think it's so clever because the way that the historical is framed around the contemporary, it means that it's as if, History isn't told in a straight line. I'm very keen on this idea that history isn't linear, that things interrelate on different levels in different ways. And, you know, seeing my work in the mix of the other works that are there as part of the Milk of Dreams, it was actually wonderful. Because actually the, it's a subject that I really respond to. Absolutely, and we'll come to the literary yeah. references in that in that show and your literary references a bit later. Yeah. What do you have pinned to your studio wall? Do you have other artists' works around you? No, I have nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. I have bits of work that I'm making and apart from that, nothing. And in my house I have nothing. <laughs> because it's a funny thing. I can carry things around in my head. I don't actually need to have, in my studio, I really don't need to have images on show for me to reference. I don't need to have something like that. Would, if I did that, it would be for someone else to see. You know, if people come to the studio, then quite often I put up a lot of drawings so they can walk around and see drawings. But I don't, I don't need to have something right there. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? You know, I've been in Italy now nine months, I think. 
And when I'm in London, I have a kind of normal route, if you like, like a mouse <laughs> going around a normal route where I, you know, I would always go see Sadie Coles, Carlos Ishigawa, House from Worth, Gagosi and White Cube, blah, 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 Tate, Serpentine. I'm going quite regularly to see all the shows, but I have to say the last nine months have been really wonderful for me because I've been able to go to the Uffizi again. I hadn't been for years Fondazione Prada, uh, Galleria d'Arte Moderna in Rome, obviously where the Klimt is, Maxi in Rome. And then there's a Pecci Foundation in Prato, which is outside of Florence, which I'd never been to before. If I do a show, say in Dusseldorf, I go to Dusseldorf or Amsterdam fairly regularly. I always go and see a museum. But just a sustained time in Italy has made it so that I have really different reference points. And that's been wonderful. I saw an interesting talk in which there was this Museo delle Navi di Nemi, which is, ah, which see, is this extraordinary yeah. Mu- yeah. museum in which is which are basically these boats that were kind of found at the bottom of a lake and then turned into a museum, but have a really interesting story around them. Yes, it's fascinating. I was really lucky. I was taken there by Valentino Nizzo, who is the director of the Villa Giulia, which is the Etruscan Museum in Rome. And he knew that I wanted to look at imagery of Hercules and, you know, mostly Etruscan objects. But he knew that I would really love this museum. And so the museum is on a lake, a small lake. You see the lake when you go into the museum. The museum is a kind of fascist building, that sort of era of building. And what you see is a reconstruction because in the lake, when they drained the lake, archaeologists found these incredible Roman ships, which were altars. So they would float on the lake and they had sculptures and they had altars and they weren't boats for voyaging. They were floating temples. Mm -hmm. And so they're a really curious part of early Roman culture because they demonstrate something about what it would be like to travel in a landscape and arrive at a place where this sort of magical construction is and how you might apply uh, devotion to some spectacle. And then the lake was drained, the museum was built, the boats were taken and reconstructed in the museum. And then the story, and in fact, Valentino uh, researched it for me because I was fascinated by it. The story is that at the end of the Second World War, when... When the fascists knew that they weren't winning the war, they burnt the boats. And that's the story. Valentino said that, in fact, that may not be the story. But what is fascinating about it, if this is the the story, is how much the boats represent, you know, the Mussolini's idea of Italy being a nation which is directly related to the Roman Empire. So this straight line, if you like, between the power of the Roman Empire and the power of contemporary, at the time, Italy, that is the rhetoric of fascism. And this sits with what I was trying to say earlier about a type of rhetoric of the classics. At the moment, there's a rise in right-wing politics. We hear a lot of this type of rhetoric about a lineage. You know, when countries were great, you know, the fantasy that countries used to be great and now that needs to be recuperated is really the rhetoric of fascism. And for me, the burning of the boats, if that is the true story, that they were burnt so that the troops that were coming, the allies that were coming to liberate Italy from fascism wouldn't have these in their power. Uh, that, that for me was really important because it demonstrates how power is not in an object but how power is transferred and how power is transferred from one age to the next that's why (laughs) that's really important that's remarkable which cultural experience changed the way you see the world so right now being in italy has utterly changed how i see the world because i would love to stay here If I could be based here, I would at the moment because I love it. I really love it. And I I think it's because I learned Italian. 
because I've visited Italy before and I couldn't speak Italian and I felt really outside of Italian culture and I felt like I sort of didn't get it. You know, when people talked quite romantically about Italy beforehand, I think, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, but I just don't, I don't quite get it. And then uh, for me, the experience of learning a language and being more a part of the life of a place and then understanding the culture quite differently because I'm understanding, you know, phrases and ways of saying and ways of thinking for me has been a total eye-opener. I didn't expect at all. And it does sound like a cliche to say you've fallen in love with Italy. (laughs) So many people do. But for me, it's been really a profound experience. It really has changed my life, I think. Well, that's fantastic. But it also speaks to that idea that, to a certain extent, as tourists, you see cities as a kind of theatre, as a kind of theatre set. Yeah. Whereas if you're ingrained in the everyday life, and as you say, through language and everything else, somehow, if it retains a certain magic, or if the magic is shifted into a new direction, then somehow it becomes even more profound an experience. Yeah, you know, I was saying earlier about um, going to my grandparents' house, there's a sense of another that you're a part of. It somehow for me feels like recuperating something of that because I've always felt that when I went to, you know, other cities in Europe, I'd feel really like a sense of, oh, I feel really at home here. Like there's something about Europe, northern parts of Italy, I recognise it, parts of Germany, I recognise it. There's a kind of sensibility that I recognise, I can't describe it particularly, but I'd feel like, oh, I really recognise this. And then I have to say that when Brexit happened, I felt like it's like someone ripped away part of who I am without asking me. (laughs) They asked me, but I said no, but it happened anyway. But, you know, I felt like that. I felt very strongly about it. That You know, it's almost like you just took away a part of my identity. And then, I guess, being in Italy felt like... Not that I think I have an Italian identity, but it felt like something similar to that space where you're in a very familiar, unfamiliar space, if that makes sense. Which writers or poets do you return to? It would be George Orwell, either Down and Out in Paris and London, or The Road to Wigan Pier. Mm. Those are the books I've read the most, uh, because those are books I know that I could always reread. I think I read quite a lot, and what I'm reading changes, but there there are kind of pinpoints of things that I would always go back to, like, for example, Edna O'Brien, Night, and August is a Wicked Month, both those books, I would reread those. Anais Nin, not the erotic writing, but collages, for example. I could reread those books mm. endlessly. But then at the same time for my work, like for example, at the moment, I'm obsessed with Starhawk, the book Truth or Dare. And I've been reading Macarena Gomez Barris. Uh, I really, really like Isabel Stenger's writing. Mm. So In Catastrophic Times, Resisting the Coming Barbarism is a really important book for me. And also Stengers in Pinyard, Capitalist Sorcery, Breaking the Spell, mm. has been a really important book for me. Sixu's essay, Coming to Writing, Ursula K. Le Guin, The Carrier Bag Theory. And I read a bit of Elizabeth Povinelli, The Inheritance. I read The Inheritance because she's talking about a history attached to a very small uh, village in northern Italy, this kind of sense of inheritance of ancient practice, Mm. belief system. So I'm filling in a lot around my own ideas with reading like that. And then this other book I really wanted to mention is Dennis Johnson, Train Dreams, because in my studio I listen to a lot of different things. And for a period of time I used to listen to interviews with writers And sometimes they were writers that I hadn't read any of their books. I I just liked listening to the way they talked. And the amount of times writers said, oh, Dennis Johnson, Train Dreams is such a great book, that I thought, I have to read this book. And it's a very slim book, but it is brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. I thought it was wonderful. 
I'll have to read it. Um, (laughs) I wanted to ask about how the literature works its way into the work, because there's sometimes, like, for instance, there's one work which has a direct quote from The Wasteland, which is called What Do We Have to Give Up to Be Free? And it has that very direct quote from The Wasteland. Then there's another work which has direct quotes from Pablo Neruda, for instance. And, And to what extent do you fuse your own thoughts and writing with those of others, or do you treat them separately in the work? With the Eliot, the Wasteland quote is, it was because I was making a piece of work directly in response to the Wasteland. And so in that way, I was really closely researching the text of the poem. And it used to be that I would insert quite a lot of quotes. But as time has gone on, I use direct quotes less and less. I find that I'm I'm doing that less and I'm writing my own text more. But I think that it is a really important part of what I'm doing is that I have to really research and read around ideas. I have to inform myself in a particular way. And that means that I'm reading quite a lot of texts. Yeah, at the moment I don't take quotes from, but I need to fill in to understand how I'm thinking. And there's another earlier painting which I wanted to ask you about where it seems that you chose to illustrate episodes from the story of the eye by Bataille. Uh, yeah. And I was interested in that idea and I, I talked about automatism earlier and I'm just wondering about your relationship with surrealism and, and the sort of atmosphere around surrealism. It's obviously very prevalent in Cecilia Alemani's Venice show. But to yeah. what extent is surrealism or the writings around surrealism influential on in what you do? I think the timing of Cecilia Alemani's show is very precise because we're living in really volatile times and surrealism comes out of a state of volatility. So the idea that things aren't um, complete, that things are broken, that dreams are interrupted, that a voice comes from somewhere else to issue a message that seems out of time or things are cut up but somehow extended through, you know, this exaggerated sense, if you like, of the interior voice, an exaggerated sense of what things mean. You know, you see something and it has kind of alternative meaning. Uh, It isn't inert. Mm. I think those are responses to living in volatile times, that you search around for meaning, you know, because you can't see a complete picture. So I think it it makes sense that Mm. the voices that occur in surrealism, they put together things that are taboo with things that seem very pedestrian. And it's as if they're collapsing the walls between these pigeonholes. They're collapsing the boundaries between the ways that things are categorised. And in a way that, that looks like a bombed city, if you see what I mean. Yeah, It's like where there used to be a kitchen and then a bedroom, now there's some rubble, a piece of bed and, you know, a frying pan. You know, if you see a a surrealist image which is like that, you think it doesn't follow in a linear way. Right. But actually the impression of it is you know what it means. Yeah. And also, I I suppose, when Apollinaire first coined the term surreal, he meant super real. And that seems to me like quite a good description of what you do. It's in the sense that your work is embedded in reality, but there is this extension beyond reality that you have as a means of, accessing reality if you see what I mean if that's not too garbled a a way of putting it no 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 that's it's right because also there there was something you were asking before about a kind of vulnerability which it took a bit of time you know putting text into a painting for me it felt a bit like a quite a big step for me because a text says something much more directly than an image you know and I think there's something about sharing thinking that's this internal kind of thinking but putting it out into a a sort of wider context that is also a part of what surrealism does that it allows the autobiographic the subjective it allows desire it allows the sort of cornucopia of feelings to be let loose outside if that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, and it goes beyond the kind of borders of restraint. I think sometimes there's maybe a misunderstanding that it's totally chaotic. It's meaningless because these things don't appear to belong together. 
that it's just a jumbled load of stuff, you know. But in fact, it, I think it does reveal something about a kind of sensibility that comes about in exaggerated times. You know, pre-war, I think you feel like you can sense a kind of storm coming. You know, if you tuned into that feeling, there are alarm bells ringing. You know, I, I think surrealism describes these kinds of um, situations. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? I um, have particular albums that I can play on repeat <laughs> because they make a, a kind of atmosphere in the studio. So one of them is Alice Coltrane, Journey into Satchidananda, which I literally could play on repeat all day. Stevie Wonder, Inner Visions, just that album. <laughs> That's my favourite album ever. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I could make work to that all day. I do make work to oh, that that's all day. Great. And Vio Farcatore is a um, musician from Senegal. There are a couple of albums of his that I could play nonstop. And the other one is Solid Air by John Martin. Mm. They just make the right atmosphere in the studio. Music-wise, I could listen to those. There, there are um, a couple of other things that are like, I'm a massive Joni Mitchell fan, but sometimes that's too disturbing in the studio, sometimes I notice it too much. And then the Utalempa singing Kurt Weill mm. is another thing that I could listen to a lot. But at the moment, I listen to non-stop. I listen to Italian radio, which is Rai 3. It's like a cultural mm. radio program because now I find that I can actually follow it. <laughs> so it's like, you know, for me, this is like just learning all the time. That's great, because that's like taps into that lovely history, long history of, for instance, the BBC World Service effectively teaching people across the world English. You know, mm. this, this mm. lovely idea that radio is a, is a medium not just for entertainment, but for education. And this sort of wonderful, hallowed feeling that people have about radio is because it has so many functions yeah. beyond the most basic form of communication. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to admit, I have had real problems listening to Radio 4 in the UK because I can't follow a radio play. I'd listen to a programme think like uh, In Our Time, I love In Our mm, Time. I yeah, listen to that and then think, I can't, I can't listen to a radio play. Somehow the fiction for me doesn't work. Right. It, it doesn't, I can't cope. <laughs> but I didn't have Wi-Fi in my studio here in, in Radio Amelia. And so I had to buy a radio, like a plug-in radio. <laughs> So I had to be reliant on old style, you know, listening to the radio. And I guess if, if I had had Wi-Fi, I would have listened to loads of different things. Yeah. Like talks online, I listen to a lot. Mm. Podcasts, where you know, I listen to. Yeah. What other media influence your work? In particular, there are two Fellini films, Satyricon and Casanova, mm. which are hugely influential. And it's to do with the way that imagery is constructed in Casanova there are scenes of the sea is made out of black plastic and they're very constructed sculpturally seemingly constructed scenes you know what people are wearing is very sculptural and the same with Satyricon it, it's um, Fellini talked about making a film about something that's that far in the past being like making a science fiction of the future because you have to really try and imagine this world you can't go to and he does it in a really sculptural sense. And also I really like the way sound works so that there's a, it's overdubbed always so that the voice isn't connected to the action. There's something about those films that for me, I can't tell you what it is, but there's a sort of sensibility that I really, really respond to. I think they're quite influential, but I couldn't say exactly how. I like that. There's some things which you can pinpoint and say that affects my work in this way, yeah. but but others, it's it, it enters you by osmosis and somehow yeah, yeah, em yeah emerges yeah. in forms you can't recognise. Yeah. Is there a discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Not really, but I do have. This is maybe to reassure myself. It takes me a bit of time to get going in the day. So I always think when I, you know, I start the day when I'm here, especially I start the day, I go out and I have a cup of coffee and I spend time and, you know, it's my thinking time. 
But then I work really late at night, quite a lot. I work really late. And I always think it's like my day's upside down. It's like, you know, this is the evening when I'm having my coffee. This is the evening that people have when they come home. If they come home from work at, I don't know, six or something, then they, they have their evening. I have mine in the morning. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I always wonder, you know, I'm sure there's a study to be done on the work produced by artists who work most at night and the work that mm. produced by artists who are daytime or morning mm. artists, you know. It's the difference between Matisse and Picasso or whatever, you know. There's, there's, yeah. there's a lot in that. I think you're right, yeah. But for me, I think it was because I was a single parent for a very long time. It was when children were in bed, then I knew I have a long time to concentrate I think I've always been a bit more of a night person anyway. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? I know exactly what it would be because I want this. <laughs> it's Old Woman with Labrette, which is a 1973 mask by Frida Deesing. And Frida Deesing is a Haida woman, an indigenous person from Canada. And she started carving when she was 43. And she made carvings of elderly figure masks. So they're old woman masks and they have long grey hair. And they have this kind of labrette, which is like, a, I think, the mouth plate makes the mouth stick out. So they have this kind of very particular indigenous form. And they have, you know, the lines on the face, you know, are very stylized. So they're very, I think, very beautiful. And I actually want... <laughs> I want to have one of these, but I can't afford it. Where did you see the work? Well, I had seen, not by her, but I'd seen a carving in a museum in Hamburg. There's a sort of anthropology museum in Hamburg, and I'd seen a, a clan carving of an elderly woman, and I loved it. And then I had a show in Canada, and the gallerist said to me, have you ever seen this artist's work? And I had seen something like it. And it was coming up in auction. And he was saying, look, this is going to be in an auction. But the, the asking price and the final price were miles away from each other. There you go. And lastly, what's art for? Well, the one good thing about art is that we don't know what it is. So it could be anything. And I think, because I, I think other people could have other ideas, will have other ideas. I think it's for sharing a kind of thinking that can't be satisfied by another discipline for opening out ideas that aren't easily fixed down, uh, for exploring thinking and asking questions and for articulating intangible ideas, things that can't be said but you know. I think it's something like that, that it has to be for me it has to be about the concerns of our age it has to be about something now you know I'm talking about making art rather than looking at art but I think it does something I don't know if ineffable is the right word but it does something that you can't say what it is but it has a really reactive life or activity Emma thank you so much <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Emma Talbot's exhibition for the Max Mara Art Prize for Women called The Age, Letta, is at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London from the 30th of June until the 4th of September. It then travels to Collezioni Maramotti in Reggio Emilia, Italy, from the 23rd of October to the 19th of February 2023. Emma's also in the Milk of Dreams at the Venice Biennale, which continues until the 27th of November. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the Art Newspaper Podcasts are Amy Dawson and Henrietta Bentall. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and a huge thank you to Emma Talbot. See you next week for a brush with Dominique Gonzalez-Fuesta. Bye for now. 
A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.